It's a great ple pleasure to welcome actually back to IISS because he's spoken here before John Mallory from the Massachusetts uh, Institute of Technologies, Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Laboratories. Um, John and I have been on the same kind of international uh, conference trail looking at issues of uh, cybersecurity, deterrence uh, and norms uh, for quite some while now and uh, I've come to have enormous respect for John's expertise both uh, you know, from an engineering perspective um, where he has a, a distinguished track record but also as somebody who almost uniquely has an equally deep and sophisticated understanding of uh, the international relations and the international security components of uh, the issues that uh, we are going to talk about. Um, I think in the light of the recent uh, visit to China, state visit by uh, Chinese President Xi Jinping um, and the uh, conclusion during that visit of an agreement between the United States uh, and China on some aspects of uh, cybersecurity that have uh, in recent years been a major um, irritant uh, in the relationship. Uh, looking at this issue um, is, is a very timely one, uh, particularly in terms of the broader context within <coughs> which it uh, takes place. So um, I'll turn over to uh, John, who's going to talk for somewhere between, you know, um, somewhere around 30 minutes, uh, and uh, then we will open up uh, for discussions, questions, and answers. So John, uh, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Nigel. It's a pleasure to be here today, and, uh, and good afternoon to the audience. Um, of the people that we have here, uh, what fields are any uh, technical people, computer science, or international relations? Cyber security. Cyber security. Mm -hmm. uh, any government officials? Diplomats? Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. you. Okay. So I've got too many slides, as usual, and um, I've got the, uh, the good material at the end. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to go fairly quickly over some of the initial slides so we have more dwell time on the later slides which talk to the, uh, the uh, U.S.-China recent agreement. So Nigel uh, talked me into uh, this title, the uh, Managing the Cyber Dimension of uh, the U.S.-China Relationship. And uh, so I'm going to try to uh, go through uh, some ideas I presented in the, um, in the, Shang uh, no, in the uh, Shanghai Forum. Uh, context in May, and then uh, putting those together with some other um, ideas that uh, come out in different contexts, and then and then walk that into the uh, the recent agreement. So the plan is to uh, look at world order considerations relative to cyber, uh, look at some of the cyber risks in the uh, China case, um, consider how you might manage these uh, emerging instabilities, and then look at the um, the summit agreements, and then draw a few conclusions. Um, there's interactions between the, uh, the cyber and information security environment and, and the world economy. Uh, Kissinger's recent book on world orders has the whole end is on the cyber question and how that disrupts traditional views of, uh, of world order. And, you know, he focuses on um, competition for economic advantage, um, large scale uh, espionage, and psychological operations. In, in this talk, I, I have a backup slide on that. that I'm not going to get into the uh, ideational part. And the emerging risks that destabilize, uh, are, you know, threaten to destabilize the global economy include uh, destabilization of international security architectures, which is a complicated question in itself, um, of how cyber interacts with traditional uh, military uh, doctrines and postures, uh, the contribution to international uh, financial crises uh, that can take place as we increase gain in those systems and need greater stability and resilience. Uh, the erosion of international trade due to economic conflict and cyber insecurity, uh, it, there's, we'll see some more on how that works, but basically it's a, it's a trade problem and if, um, if competition gets too rough, uh, then countries are likely to uh, pull back uh, behind their borders uh, into perhaps trading blocks. 
And then uh, there's a problem of undermining trust and cooperation due to political tensions. So security, uh, insecurity about security questions can undermine uh, strategic trust and trust in general, and then that can propagate. So, so I propose several approaches to deal with it, one of which is um, uh, discussions on uh, cyber military stability, which it's not clear to me we actually have in place, but that should be there both for nuclear, very important that that's, there are no mistakes there, and also for uh, conventional military. Uh, but we're probably moving in that direction. And people like Joe and I say that we need to have a, uh, a pugwash-like dialogue the way we had uh, with, the, um, with nuclear weapons over 40 years, but this is a more complicated domain. And so um, you know, we need some good ideas on how to uh, do better or faster. Uh, I talk about the uh, protection of the critical financial infrastructures and how one could work together. Uh, that's motivated in part uh, due to the Chinese national security law in which they were going to um, um, put constraints on financial institutions to do local sourcing and exclude uh, foreign suppliers. Uh, I'll talk about um, adherence to WTO trips that we primarily respect for intellectual property as defined there, which includes clarification of the national security exceptions uh, because given that espionage is not prohibited by international law, you're welcome to do it. So um, if, uh, if you're restricting espionage for commercial gain, um, then you have to also identify which parts are military related, therefore not covered, um, and which parts are purely civilian, which would be covered. Um, and then uh, talk to um, phased increases in assurance uh, in the globalized uh, ICT technology uh, plane. This is basically an arms reduction concept. So Kissinger you know, is concerned with uh, the rapid proliferation of computing and networking and how that's revolutionized everything. And, um, and he's right. Um, it, it, we spread it everywhere, and you can't be sure that structures that were there beforehand continue to function the way you think they functioned prior to cyber. Um, he looks to uh, the competition among states with a uh, few norms to, to constrain it, uh, in which they attempt to uh, gain strategic advantage uh, in this do new domain and hide sort of in the fog of complexity and emerging technologies. And you end up in a Hobbesian anarchy uh, for in an interstate cyber struggle. Uh, and then it, for vectors of economic conflict, he looks at uh, economic um, seeking economic advantage via the theft of intellectual property, large-scale espionage, and psychological operations. And uh, he says our understanding and policy lag the technology emergence. So we have a revolution in societal vulnerabilities as ICT becomes you know, uniformly linked to um, social processes, and nobody's thought about how that global substrate can be used as a low ground, if you will, to attack any part of, uh, of a society which previously was uh, immune to such attacks. In the case of the United States, we had great you know, strategic depth from a physical point of view, but now strategic depth is much shorter to milliseconds, how fast you can, you can travel over the network. Attribution has been difficult, although uh, the United States is doing much better these days, and there's a, essentially a hierarchy of attribution capability uh, among states and that's a, a question of uh, yeah, undermines deterrence, but the deterrence is undermined differentially. So if you're a low capacity country and you would be unable to do attribution, uh, then you, you could be more vulnerable uh, to attack because you couldn't figure out who did it. Um, whereas if you're high capability uh, cyber power, uh, you'd be much more likely to figure it out. And that's a systemic problem overall in the system. We're not really going to talk to that, but people usually ignore that problem. They usually focus on the big actors, you know, what are we doing about Russia, what are we doing about China, maybe Iran, maybe North Korea. Um, and then when you say, well, what about 190 countries with cyber offensive capabilities, what are you going to do? And eyes roll back in their heads, basically. Don't know what to do. So Kissinger concludes that cyber risks have outstripped strategy and doctrine. Um, so he says we should have uh, you know dialogues to uh, to deal with this, as I mentioned, and he sees this uh, elements for stability as uh, effective deterrence, uh, restraint on state behavior, and measures to avoid uh, misinterpretation and miscommunication. Uh, 
He also raises the issue of asymmetry of values at risk. So when we get into cross-domain deterrence, um, you know, the, when the other guy doesn't have what you have, and so you have to select some other target to respond to, and you're trying to be proportional, uh, you may have problems of whether he believes that that was proportional or not. That's a whole other discussion, but the but proportionality judgments are a problem when you have to when you're talking about cross-domain responses and also cross-domain deterrence. And then Kissinger really uh, goes off on the rise of rel relative truth. Really, he's kind of keying on what you can do with the internet and this new mass media, which is really analogous to what Hitler did with the radio in the 1930s. Um, he doesn't really have any answers. Uh, this is my uh, little chart. Um, on the levels of cyber conflict to characterize multi-level cyber conflict. And uh, it's not just the usual sort of military, uh, you know, military on military or intelligence service on intelligence service or uh, cyber crime problem. <clears throat> it includes several economic layers where there's a whole R&D competition, a strategic competition to uh, maintain uh, technological leadership or challenges, as the case might be. There's the operation of ICT, which was really highlighted in the Snowden affair, who controls the telecom and things of these issues of this sort. Um, are uh, you know, ICT supply chains secure? Um, that whole question, Huawei comes up a lot of times in these contexts. And then there's sort of the economic dimension of uh, systemic stability in the international economic order and how that works. And so you can have and then ideation on top. The Ch Russians and the Chinese sort of love the psychological operations. And, uh, and so we're seeing more of that taking advantage of the uh, internet connectivity and the ability to influence uh, mass publics. It's probably worth just noting on that point that today when you speak to the domestic audience, uh, it's much easier for the foreign audiences to pick it up and vice versa. So you can have this uh, audience confusion problem of, not, of misinterpreting what's being said because you don't actually realize who the intended audience is. So in terms of world order scenarios, um, we had a recent workshop on this uh, back in the US, which Nigel was at. i just give you one slide on it. I'm going to focus primarily on the liberal trading system as we go through this, uh, this talk. And that's been a great system so far. Um, you know, it, 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 we had a multilateral trading system that was put in place after World War II. It has enabled uh, a you know, big rise in, uh, in world trade and enabled uh, globalization. And, um, and many countries have benefited from this, including uh, China, which has had a tremendous rise. And, um, however, if, uh, if there are large-scale neo-mercantilist actors in this environment uh, who are using predatory techniques like exchange rate uh, manipulation, non-tariff barriers to trade, uh, forced technology transfer, and large-scale industrial espionage to enhance their economic position, um, the responses uh, you know, are to move to a degenerate system where those who play by the rules lose because they can't uh, compete with the cheaters, or they, um, they go to competing trade blocks as a way to protect themselves. And the economists usually talk about, about competing trade blocks. Yeah, as a footnote, one might note that the United States has been engaged in two free trade agreements. One is the, uh, uh, the Trans-Pacific uh, you know, Partnership, which uh, they recently agreed to and now they need to ratify, which brings in an Asian sector into a free trade zone, which excludes China at the present time, but, but offers to raise uh, the standards of uh, world trade and rules of enforcement to a higher level than we see in the current WTO. And then also the uh, TTIP with the Europeans, which is now coming to be on the front burner. So that's kind of a potential block that you could have if you were unhappy with the trading relationship that uh, you were dealing with in the China case. Or if you don't do anything and you just let uh, you know, uh, uh, cheaters continue, uh, you can end up in a situation where you've lost. And, uh, and that would be sort of the OECD countries and Western democracies. And now you have a new world order that emerges with some kind of perhaps Chinese uh, global hegemony, and we don't really know what that would look like. I'm not really convinced that the Chinese I've interacted with have a real model of that. Oftentimes the model is, well, we're anti-imperialism and we're going to roll back 500 years of Western imperialism, but, um, but that's about it. So the cyber risks that, um, you know, that uh, they're involved here is the destabilization of international security architectures, 
Uh, this particular slide summarizes a few <coughs> of the challenge cases from a 2011 talk in Shangsha. Um, but basically, you have insecurity dilemmas where um, you um, you want to build more cyber offense because you're afraid of the other guy uh, building more cyber offense, um, and and also it's cheaper to build offense than defense, so um, so you build more offense, and then you can run into problems of reduced crisis stability uh, with momentum-driven cyber conflict. That is to say, first mover advantage, which um, which forces the other guy to act and want to get rid of that. Um, short decision times, uh, so there isn't time to really think it through. And then escalatory pressure due to misjudgments of proportionality and cross-sector or, uh, or uh, escalatory dynamics. And then there's also the question of catalytic attacks on key infrastructure by third parties. So you're having a crisis and some third party comes along and whacks a telecom core. And you think it's the second party you know, trying to you know, interrupt your command and control. So these are problems that need to be addressed. And, um, and they lead to uh, security-driven mistrust, arms races, accidental conflict, uncontrolled escalation, and potentially financial crises. So the financial crisis idea is, um, you know, we, we've, we've seen the 2008 financial crisis, and uh, people have been concerned that uh, perhaps a malicious actor would attempt to uh, replicate that and, and induce that kind of situation from cyber. Um, so, so one of the key questions is, you know, how good is the resilience of the uh, of, of the key international financial uh, uh, systems, and um, and are they uniform across countries? So I think this is actually a great response to the Chinese, uh, you know, view of well, we need to do all of the software locally for uh, for the for the banking sector, for example. Uh, well, actually, if the uh, if if the, the U.S. you know financial sector was to blow out or a European one, then the Chinese would also be in trouble. So we have a shared a risk or an interdependent risk, and so it would behoove us actually to uh, identify what the correct standards would be to reduce those risks and then to raise them uniformly across all of the, uh, uh, the key economies. And if we have uh, an industrial sector uh, that's able to uh, implement that, then uh, we ought to, uh, to use them so we get best practices. So we get a, sort of a two for one. We have a shared problem that we can work on together. And, uh, and we could share the infrastructure that, uh, that delivers a solution. So um, we could pretty much discuss the international trade problem, but essentially um, there's been a lot of complaint about the IP theft. Um, the United States has uh, gotten organized. Uh, I didn't put it in here, but uh, in 2011, you know, I presented a challenge case to the Chinese, more or less stating what you've already heard. And, and that they needed to back off that or undermine this, the liberal trading system. And then an escalation uh, ladder in 2013, uh, which had a bunch of escalatory moves that you could make step by step until you got compliance with WTO trips. And so there's been discussion of that. And there's $4 trillion in annual uh, global trade in ICT products, and it's the poster child for WTO. So if you undermine that, you are really undermining um, the uh, global trading system. And, and that, of course, would be bad. The last time we, we, uh, we undermined global trade, we had a bad experience after the 1930s, so we may not want to repeat that. Um, then there's the political tensions. I'm not going to go into this too much, but, um, but it's a problem, and, and you need to get interpretations right. Otherwise, people move into worst-case analysis, and that doesn't usually lead uh, to a very good place. So this is the idea. A lot of people say, oh, we're going to have a, an arms control treaty and we're going to ban cyber weapons. We're going to do something with cyber weapons. And the problem, of course, is nobody knows what a cyber weapon is. It's really organizations with a set of techniques, uh, tools, and procedures that they use. And that's hard to characterize. And it's not uh, easily uh, seen. So my idea is let's turn that around and let's, let's take the vulnerabilities out of the system that let the lower end actors um, uh, engage in this activity. So we'll raise a level of assurance as a mechanism to forego um, uh, offensive capability. In that way, we would shift the balance in favor of defense. This would be good. It would, instead of having an offense-dominated approach to uh, to cyber defense, we could move more towards defense, and um, and so it would have a lot of stabilizing effects uh, across the board. 
it's verifiable and enforceable. You can look at uh, the products and you can test them and see if they meet the standard. And it gives you a, a, a monotonic path towards uh, raising the cost of malicious actors. Dialogues focused on military stability we touched on. I, this is very important. Um, and I think that um, you know the U.S., Russia, and China certainly need to do this. And anybody else who's you know, eyeball to eyeball with an, with a potential adversary ought, ought to be doing the same thing, uh, figuring out how they're going to manage scenarios. We've talked to the uh, protection of critical financial infrastructures a bit, um, but this is important, and um, and uh, we should do that. This is a slide on the adherence to WTO trips. Um, and and yeah, and we believe um, that uh, that trips protects uh, companies from the theft of their uh, intellectual property or business secrets for commercial gain. Um, I've talked to Carla Hills who negotiated that that treaty. She believes it. Uh, the current USTR people believe it as well. Uh, there's some academic outliers who want to make uh, long reaches. But essentially, uh, TRIPS requires a, a signatory, that would be anybody who signed up to WTO, uh, to um, put in place uh, legal standards in order to enforce uh, uh, intellectual property protections domestically. And, um, and presumably that applies also internationally. It's not some kind of exception that, that if you can reach abroad. So that's basically what this slide says. And um, I'm going to move along. Mentioned the national security exception. Um, this can be an issue. China previously thought that the economy was a national security item, and therefore anything that had to do with the economy would be in the national security exception, or so American analysts believe. Um, and then we have the raise the uh, standards in uh, of the global ICT uh, supply chain. <clears throat> so there's a series of architectural flaws that we know about, which are failure to implement science from the 1970s that give rise to probably 80% of the, um, of the malicious activity that takes place in cyberspace today. Um, so we would be well advised to, in a prioritized fashion, um, get the uh, ICT capital goods industry to remove those. And um, there's probably three or four, plus the uh, PKI system, which is the public key crypto system, needs to be a little bit solider. Um, so if you were to make that happen, you would, you would get a big impact. Um, the ways you can make it happen are you can phase out liability protection for these companies and let the insurance companies um, enforce this. Uh, you can regulate them directly, which in many countries, is, you know, that can be done. For example, Germany. Uh, in the United States, it's more of a problem. There's a lot of political opposition to that. Or you can talk about um, minimum standards for being able to cross borders with ICT products, which I uh, pr proposed in the spring. So that's that section. <coughs> now we'll look at the summit agreements. This is kind of the prep. So I gave a talk more or less like this in the um, at, at the Shanghai Forum. There were a number of very interesting Chinese present, uh, former people from the Cyber uh, Space Administration, people who were drafted into it for the uh, for the summit, uh, two of them that were drafted in, in for the summit, uh, and some others. And then I, I worked with uh, with some Chinese also developing some input of high impact norms. Uh, that could be uh, put into the summit agenda on the theory that nobody else will do that. So I might as well just go for the, the high-end ones and maybe somebody will do something. Um, and then what we see coming out is this. <coughs> so everybody was impressed that we have uh, <coughs> a sentence in there which, in which uh, uh, the China Xi Jinping signs up to um, essentially um, uh, protect intellectual property according to WTO trips. Um, so that's a first, and people think that that's a big deal when the leader says that. Um, we have other uh, statements like cyber norms that, um, that, that China and the U.S. are going to work to enhance uh, uh, cyber norms in the U.N. GGE process, move forward on that. That's great. Um, they welcome the uh, report in, um, of, uh, in, that came out in July from the recent uh, U.N. GGE group. And, um, they're going to create a senior expert uh, group to f for further discussions on cyber norms. And I think, I think that's all great. I mean, if, if people complain about this, what's the counter domain? What, if you're not going to try to you know, move forward and make progress and stabilize things, then what is it that you're going to do? And nobody has any answers you know, apart from we will have a grand strategy and, uh, and, and we will beat them somehow, but 
what that whatever beat means is you know poorly defined, and the costs of uh, engaging in that activity are also not defined. They also agreed to uh, engage on um, investigations of malicious cyber activity, and with timely responses to requests for information. And, and the cooperation, of course, would be consistent with national law and, and treaty obligations, which basically means um, that it'll be a, a, a what's the word? It's double um, legal liability, if you will. That uh, if it's doubly illegal. So if it's illegal in both countries, then it's going to be easier to do the cooperation. So the norms that they're agreeing to here, this is a chart, it's kind of busy. Um, but the main norms in the UNGGE were the agreement to not attack critical infrastructures, and <clears throat> agree to uh, assist uh, states who are having a cyber problem or are in need, and agree to um, <clears throat> not use certs for um, malicious purposes. But there's some other things in here that are very interesting, uh, including um, supply chain integrity. Now, I think the Ru a Russian claim that, that they uh, inserted that, but I just think that's uh, interesting that it, it made it into the uh, report and that the country signed off on it. Um, <clears throat> also interesting is that the Chinese signed off on the human rights provision which is in there, which basically says that uh, that there's a, you know an information access human right uh, associated with uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which is a position that the U.S. has had. And there's also a capacity building component. So <clears throat> So, so people complain, you know, in the U.S. and all these people complaining that, oh, the Chinese will just cheat, they'll keep doing it, we're fools, we don't have any compliance, um, and, you know, all kinds of anti-Obama statements and so forth. And, uh, and my view is, well, these are the people who don't know what they're talking about, actually. Um, and uh, I look at it this way. <coughs> I look at the economic fact sheet, which nobody looks at it from the cybersecurity world, and it starts off with world order statements. Now, these are very interesting. Now, you could say it's just boilerplate, but basically it's a recognition that uh, the, the Chinese see themselves depending on the international trading system as multilateral economic institutions that help support that, and that this, is, this has benefited them in, in a major way in the last 35 years, and uh, they're not interested in sinking that. They also agreed to uh, <coughs> a high-level dialogue um, to improve uh, the, the, the judicial, judicial system in um, in China so that it can uh, make for a better business environment so businesses can predict what's going to happen, they'll be able to invest. And um, so I think that's very interesting. <coughs> and more interesting is the section on, um, that's interesting because it's a world order statement and a recognition that you can't, you have an interdependence with that world order and, and that's the first step to becoming a status quo uh, power to help maintain and do system maintenance on that world order. Um, the trade and economic in ICT products is also very interesting. So they see uh, the, uh, the technology trade as a pillar of bilateral uh, relationship and, uh, and want to move forward on that, even though we have high cyber insecurity on both sides. Everybody's afraid of supply chain influence by the other power. Um, they affirm support for technology product uh, international standards. So this is really interesting for me because I've been talking about the information assurance question in terms of arms control and, um, and then suggested in, uh, in April that we could you know, try um, raising the level of assurance through uh, sort of, you know, requirements for international trade and, so, and there we see this in, in this agreement. Then there's competition policy so they want to, you know, they agreed to make that uh, fair and non-discriminatory. Uh, there's a lot of concern in the European Union about uh, European um, IT companies being pushed out of the Chinese market by various kinds of nationally oriented uh, laws, including the, the banking law. Um, they committed to enhance cybersecurity in commercial ICT sectors with generally applicable information assurance measures. So that's more on the international product standards. <clears throat> and in particular, they talk about um, international cybersecurity regulations that should comply with WTO agreements. That makes sense. Narrow scope. Adhere to international norms, not discriminate. So this kind of gives us some more details and not impose nationally based restrictions on the purchase, sale, or use of ICT products. So that's again maintaining international trade in ICT products. And then again in the economic uh, section, um, these are quotes. 
um, more intellectual property protection statements, including trade secrets, and, con and commit not to, to ad not to advance generally applicable policy to practice that require the transfer of intellectual property rights or technology as a condition of doing business. So in other words, the indigenous innovation policy is out if, if, we stick with, if they stick with this. And the countries aff affirm that they won't uh, support a misappropriation of intellectual property, including trade secrets and other confidential business information with the intent of providing competitive advantages to their companies or commercial sectors. But both countries affirm that states and companies should not, by legal methods, make use of technology and commercial advantage to gain uh, commercial advantage. These are major <coughs> statements in, in what has been a major issue. And uh, interestingly enough, when I started down this path, and I think I might have met Nigel at this point, um, it was 2011 and I went to a conference in Changsha and I did a challenge case on intellectual property protection and told the Chinese they're going to have a big problem here because when I aggregate all the instances of, of you know, what you've been doing and then I say my response is going to be proportionate to that aggregate, you have a big problem. So one week before this agreement, uh, President Obama goes to Fort Meade as a fitting backdrop and says that the way he looks at this problem is he aggregates uh, all the activity, and he sees that as a major national security concern. And uh, so I thought that was interesting. Five years later, that comes out. So here's my take on the uh, Obama C uh, summit agreement. Oh, it's not quite yet. <clears throat> There's a whole law enforcement piece, and I would say that the Chinese seem to think this is the most important piece. How do you make the law enforcement side work? Because if we get the government not, uh, not engaged in state sponsors of es espionage, and maybe the SOEs out of the picture, so that they're not doing it either. <coughs> then we have the non-government sector with proxies. So now you're into a law enforcement domain, and can you make that interoperate? So I think this is a very interesting piece, and uh, it also has a piece in terms of uh, crisis stability because it's going to require the exchange of forensic data uh, to be able to generate uh, actionable evidence in the other guy's um, legal system. And, and that's basically moving up the interoperability ladder. So if you did have a higher level crisis, you would already have that as a baseline for being able to talk about who did what. So, so here's my idea on the, uh, on the agreement, is uh, there's no talk of a compliance framework uh, for it on how you're going to protect IP. Um, it's probably implicit, and everybody knows that this is going to happen. And my concern is that, there, you know, that the expectations will be different across the two sides. So we need to have a, a discussion to get on the same page as to what the expectations are for performance uh, and implementation, and also how you phase that. Because for those who uh, want to see China as a cheater, they'll find one mistake that they've made, and then they'll then claim that the whole agreement is worthless, and then we'll go down another path, and we could get into some tit for tat. And you can be sure any time a government is involved, there will be mistakes. They never do it right. And uh, so you have to be able to handle those mistakes. And so that means we'll need a coordination mechanism for handling errors and any issues that arise. We need to clarify the WTO TRIPS obligations. What does that really mean? And uh, what do we expect it to mean? Uh, we need to define what the government entities are. Obviously, uh, PLA and MSS and their direct proxies are going to be you know, government collectors. Uh, but what about beneficiaries? What about SOEs? are all SOEs government entities. If an SOE engages in this activity, uh, did it violate the agreement? <coughs> it's important to separate national security uh, intelligence collection from industrial espionage, because if you're using the same botnet and command and control uh, for your national security stuff, and lo and behold, oh, some commercial technology, the toothpaste stuff, comes through that mm -hmm. network, and then somebody sees it, then they can get the wrong idea. And they could say, oh, well, this whole network over here really isn't just intelligence. It's actually collecting this IP, and maybe that shouldn't be there. So that question comes up. And then, uh, as we just mentioned, uh, if the private sector um, engages in this kind of IP theft, then we have to have uh, you know, law enforcement measures that will, in good faith, uh, pursue uh, people for criminal <coughs> violations. So... <coughs> Actually, I think I'm, I'm, on, I'm on time and under budget. You're doing very well. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the, my conclusions are, you know, basically that emerging cyber risk can threaten the global economy. Uh, we reviewed a set of these. And then we can mitigate these risks if we uh, have dialogues focused on mm -hmm. military cyber stability. We work to protect uh, critical financial infrastructures. We adhere to WTO trips. And we clarify the national security exceptions. 
um, which are really pretty vague. They're almost anything a state says it is. Um, and then we need to have phased increases in uh, assurance of globalized ICT supply chains. And I might mention on that point, um, if you can't enforce intellectual property protection, it's very difficult to have transparency for information assurance on, on supply, ICT supply chains, because nobody will show you. If you have a solid uh, IP protection story, uh, then you're in a much better position to say, I need to inspect the source code or the hardware design on your system to make sure that it's actually up to standard. So those two are really interdependent, and if you want to do the supply chain, you probably need to solve the IP problem first. And that may well have been recognized. So in my view, the obama shi agreement includes uh, positive steps to avoid world order risks. Uh, if China adheres to the uh, to WTO trips, um, that's going to be very big and important. Um, and frankly, I don't think it's that big a cost. Because if we look at uh, the total sum of espionage that they might be doing, probably only 25% of it is purely commercial anyway. So it's not like they're giving up everything. Fair trade in ICT products reinforces uh, the international uh, trading regime, enables investment. That'll probably help China get more investment into the Chinese uh, market uh, right there. And of course, there's the bilateral investment agreement that uh, they've been talking about and they're working on. So moves to reduce ICT and security with information assurance standard, that's great. Um, that's the first step I really know about in this direction. Um, and maybe others, people know about other steps, but that, that's the one I know about. Um, fair treatment of business under the Chinese legal system, that will really help. Um, I, you know, the European Union uh, downgraded the Wuxian uh, conference on the participation there because they were upset about um, this economic dimension excluding, excluding um, uh, European businesses. Uh, maybe if they uh, were to stick to this, then they would uh, send a more senior representative. Incidentally, the Germans uh, upgraded from from the janitor to junior. <laughs> so, and, um, and also it, it opens up uh, the issue of, uh, of processes for law enforcement cooperation. Working that issue, it's, that's a good issue to work and, um, and it can uh, help with uh, you know, better uh, mutual understanding. I mean, the systems are a bit different. Uh, there'll be problems in uh, standards of evidence and chain of custody the way we have it in the United States. Um, but those will all be good, actually, for, uh, for trying to improve the effectiveness of law enforcement. <clears throat> so, um, so compliance and further deepening of fair trading concepts are the path to stabilizing a liberal trading system. Uh, China recognizes the need to stabilize that the, we know that they recognize the uh, need to stabilize the U.S. relationship. That's why this particular summit got such high level attention on cyber, whereas before, you know, they really, in 2013, they didn't really pay much attention to it. At this point, uh, they basically bought the argument that the United States was at a tipping point, it was going to escalate, people were talking about grand strategies for containment of China and so forth, and it's best that it did not go off the rail in the last years of the Obama administration because there's high uncertainty about what comes next, and whoever comes next will probably start off with a which was a more robust um, uh, China policy after having made uh, excessive claims during the campaign. Afterwards, reality will probably bite them. <clears throat> this, the agreement also recognizes the value of the multilateral liberal international trading system. That's great to have that reaffirmed. And it may become a st China may become a status quo power uh, in the system as it recognizes the benefits that it derives from the system. <coughs> so that's my talk. John, thank, thank you, you very much indeed. That was fantastic, really informative, very wide-ranging. And uh, incidentally, you've just uh, uh, helped me finish the chapter that <laughs> I'm in the process of writing uh, for my, my own book on exactly this. So thank you very much. That, 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 that saved me hours of, uh, of uh, detailed uh, research. But uh, no, there's, there's a lot there, um, and we've got about uh, 20 minutes for questions and answers. I should have said at the outset, I didn't actually check with you, but I take it you're okay for this to be on the record? Sure, why not? Yeah, yeah okay. Uh, in that context, <laughs> thank you. Right. Um, uh, could I please invite those of you who do want to raise questions and comments, please to begin by telling us uh, who you are so, so you know, we, we have a good record. Yes, sir. Despite all of this, which, uh, I mean, 
we've known about this problem for 25, 30 years. Which problem? Oh, the, the whole uh, information age. Oh, the cyber problem? Uh, cyber problem, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, Arvind Toffler was writing about it a long time ago. Despite all that, in reality, if you're a business and somebody, whoever it is, whether it's the Chinese or anyone else, particularly in this country, steals your information, it's extremely hard to do anything about it. So we have an awful long way to go to make it practical. So we haven't solved the problem here. And uh, I, you know, on your first comment, I would say that, <clears throat> so we knew the industry was, there were losers by, mm. by 1990, when the better systems lost, and we started going into commodity systems of poor security. And, um, and then we had the internet revolution, where you couldn't spend a lot of money on, the, on computer security, because they really didn't have any value on it. So then we spread insecurity everywhere, and now we figured out the value and we need to do something. Um, you know, raising the level of security is really coming to the fore uh, for the industry because there's been a, a, a huge uh, loss of confidence in, um, in ICT by everybody. And the, there's pressure on the, uh, the big IT vendors uh, to do much better in this environment. At the same time, uh, if you look at maybe the cases like Nortel, when a state actor comes after you as a company with a multi-spectrum attack, which means he's got insiders telling him what he wants to steal, he's got cyber guys stealing everything for a decade, and he's got the uh, C-suite blackmailed so they don't put any confidence security in, it's fairly hard to resist if you're a company. Because for example, that would be unfair, unfair play. Um, so if the states, if we can get state restraint and raise uh, level of, uh, of security, then I think we can do a lot better. But it's a big challenge, and computer security itself is riddled with what we call infosec uh, grand challenges. So these are pretty close to you know unsolved open technical problems. And there's many of these that you would need to have uh, anything approximating a perfectly secure technology plane where you just put things together and they work. And there's a whole other discussion about how you do that. I'd say the short story is that you want to make it hard for attackers. So you pick your set of attackers, and you're really going to start with the low-end ones, that the 80%, and you're going to try to get those kind of improvements into the commodity technology plane. Then you're going to have to redesign those and have a new generation that are actually designed from the bottom up for security modular sets of uh, national security considerations uh, in this domain, which complicate uh, everything more. But how about the legal protection? I mean, legally, it's very hard to do anything. Well, legal, legal's good. I'm not a, uh, a lawyer. I know enough to be dangerous, but uh, I have two years <laughs> of studying the cyber law. But, but uh, yeah, you need to move the legal system forward uh, to be able to manage these questions. Um, <clears throat> one of my favorites is, uh, you know, the um, harmonization of data protection across jurisdictions. So if we could do this in the context of uh, Europe and the United States, then we could enable much more cloud computing. Uh, but when I, I was on a commission for you know cloud computing with a bunch of CEOs, and I brought this up, and they didn't want to talk about it. I said, oh, no, don't even bring that up. Uh, but now it's on the agenda. Now we have the safe harbor agreement fallen down. Um, so being able to harmonize um, you know, the legal treatment and how we're going to respond would be actually very good and it would enable a lot of trade. Um, and also, I would say the Americans would get better privacy and, um, and um, from company you know, issues and um, the European governments might get more access. It's full of mm -hmm. contradictions. Uh, you get fined a thousand times more for uh, keeping secret bank secrets for money launderers and tax evaders than you do for actually disclosing it. And there's also public goods problems ruled all over the space. You know, one of which is you know you have two parties, one's the provider, one's the customer, and then they get the third party's data. Well, who looks after that? Not a problem. John, can I ask a question? Sure. Uh, because you said at one point uh, the kind of uh, um, logic of this. Um, whole uh, agreement. This process is uh, that, that indigenous uh, innovation in China goes out the window, but of course it doesn't. Um, um, in insofar as uh, you know, there there is uh, um, quite an innovative uh, indigenous ICT sector 
in China, which is actually private. It's not state-owned enterprises. And uh, most of the time when you talk to these people, their main complaint is not what you know, America's doing, what we're doing. Their main complaint is what their own government is doing in terms of putting bureaucratic barriers uh, in, in, you know, in their way. Mm-hmm. Um, we also look at, uh, for example, the capabilities of uh, uh, an ICT service provider like Huawei, uh, who, whose capabilities in, in many respects are actually now mm-hmm. superior to those of many you know, Western uh, ICT um, competitors, you know, one of the few companies that can uh, put together, a, you know, a four, potentially even 5G network, uh, you know, end-to-end using, you know, purely indigenous uh, indigenous products. So I misspoke. Um, when I said indigenous innovation, mm. I meant quote-unquote indigenous innovation. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> I, I, I was assuming so, that was where I was so, getting to, but... Uh, so, so that would be the mm. policy where, in order to uh, do business in China in certain sectors, you'd be required to have a local partner Mm. and or share the, uh, y- your technology with them. In terms of innovation in China, I think there's mm. tremendous innovation in yeah. China. Mm. Um, we see all kinds of, it, of things, and this sort of notion that uh, China can't uh, learn and can't innovate, I think, mm. is uh, very wrong-headed. Um, uh, but, of course, there are you know, bureaucratic and cultural mm. barriers that they might want to uh, you know, consider reducing in order to, uh, mm. to uh, free up the uh, potential. But, but by the same token, if I can carry on this uh, discussion, when one talks to Chinese counterparts, and we do this, you know, as you know, on a regular basis, that, you know, they say, basically, we don't feel safe with the status quo. We don't feel safe with our current reliance on uh, almost exclusively uh, U.S. designed and uh, produced uh, software hardware, particularly in the light of the Snowden revelations. And, of course, these have been massively... Um, exaggerated in terms of the you know their imp- you know what 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 is uh, possible, but terms like prison gate have now kind of entered you know the uh, Long Jingman have uh, kind of entered the, the Chinese uh, discourse. You know. um, I mean, um, it seems a reasonable aspiration if you're looking at the, from the Chinese perspective that they they do want to feel more uh, more secure about. Um, you know, uh, the, 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 this kind of risk. To what extent does this agreement actually offer that assurance? Well, I think we see that in the um, agreement on international standards. Mm. I mean, just to build on that slightly, uh, so, so China bought a lot of Cisco equipment and mm. put it everywhere, including all over the government. Yep. And uh, and if it was the United States and it was Huawei equipment all over the uh, government, you know, they would be having heart attacks, I think. Um, but mm. that's their, the situation that they have. So mm. I think that... Um, you got two choices there. You can either invent everything yourself and hope you can interoperate and you can do it in time to get going, which is um, not easy, uh, probably impossible. Uh, or you can move towards uh, higher standards of, uh, of information assurance. And um, if you're at the table and defining these and their uh, objective scientific standards and the system adheres to those standards, you should be happy. I mean, and I think that is the challenge for trade in ICT. I mean, more generally, not just with China, it's for everybody. How, if I'm going to have tremendous societal dependence on this technology, I need to be able to trust it. Mm-hmm. And um, the only way I can trust it is if I can check it. And so, but even then, you know, you're only going to have probably, at the present time, maybe 12 mm-hmm. to 20 countries with the indigenous capacity to be able to do checking. Mm-hmm. Right? Otherwise, you know, you're going to get somebody else. Mm-hmm. Say, take the case of Jordan, um, their telecom, and they outsource it to France Telecom, so it's France Telecom's problem to help them. Mm-hmm. They got a, 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 cyber, you know, a denial of service attack on them, which was exceeded the total bandwidth in the country, oh. which stopped everything. So France Telecom was able to send mm-hmm. that to a data center in France, sort it out, and then start sending them the mm-hmm. real traffic, mm-hmm. and then Royal Jordanian Airlines could actually start flying again. Mm-hmm. So, um, and then the response, of course, was three lines through Israel. So they'll have to take out Israel next time. <laughs> but, but you're going to have yeah, situations yeah. like mm-hmm. that, and yeah. you have to think about not just the major cyber powers with the mm-hmm. capacity to do the checking or to generate the systems, but what about everybody else? Mm-hmm. And how do we improve, uh, you know, their level of confidence in the system? Yes, sure. I'm Sean Connor, U.S. National Intelligence Council. Uh, you mentioned the GTE report. And then we focused on the China-U.S. recent agreement. 
the norm against cyber commercial espionage was not included in the GGB report. Correct. Mm -hmm. Now that China and the U.S. seem to have reached an agreement on that, would we expect the broader international community to collectively adopt that norm? I mean, I think that particular norm is a reaffirmation of TRIPS. So mm -hmm. if they're in WTO, they already signed up to it. So it shouldn't be too much trouble for the international community to reaffirm it. So you think we might see that norm in the next GGE report? Why not? I mean, I think that would make sense. Well, that, that presumes the next GGE, and I'm not sure we've quite got there yet. Mm. Well, they proposed again. Yeah, indeed. Mm. I mean, you, you bring up the GGE, when we look at some of those norms, they're, they're thin. Mm. Just like the agreement, there's a top-level statement, and then there's a lot of implementation to be done. So let's just take the example of uh, don't attack the critical infrastructure. Um, so that's all great, but it's really um, meaningless. Why? Hmm. Okay. In peacetime. Don't hmm. attack it in peacetime. That's what the norm. Why is it meaningless? Because it's not going to be, uh, when I attack it, it's going to be wartime. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> because I just blew up a major um, you know, part of your critical infrastructure. So it's really never going to happen. What you know, the real problem there is that the, the presence of actors in your critical infrastructure and particularly putting in implants or mining your critical infrastructure, that increases instability because <coughs> one false move, something goes wrong and the other guy's critical infrastructure blows up and then he finds your implant and, and then he's unhappy and something comes back at you. Or even worse, third party comes along, hijacks your implant and sets it off and has you and him fight. <coughs> so. You know, I complained about this in going into the Dutch uh, process that, that that's the key stability question of how do you manage that. And um, it didn't make it into the, uh, into the report, but I would say it's something to think about. You know, are we just going to accept that all critical infrastructures will be mined and that random third party can come along and, and, um, and set them off? Are we going to have standards for how I do cyber offense and make these implants such that they're cryptographically controlled and there's positive national command authority control over these things so that the third party is not getting in? And uh, I think that goes against the notion of export controls and the sort of Wozner idea of uh, we're not going to expand um, cyber security. So these things get tangled up. And you have to sort of sort out what the balance is, how can you phase it. Thank you. Yes. IIS member Vipul Thakur. There's rivalry between the USA and China in the Far East. If China pushes a bit too hard and if there is some hot incident, could it punch holes in this agreement? Well, I mean, it really depends. That's a tough question. Um, you know, pick your problem. Uh, maritime disputes, sink a few boats. I don't know, it depends on whether they can contain it or not. Um, but if you have total war, it probably would punch a hole in this agreement. Mm. Yeah. Probably not going to have total war, that would be expensive. Mm. Um, I think, you know, the Chinese told me something very interesting. I mean, I was talking about the, the maritime um, uh, disputes that, that they have, and that, you know, some of the U.S. issue is with those maritime disputes because they want to have the right to to navigation and you can't claim islands that you've uh, built up under the law of the sea. And, uh, and so we're sort of talking about that and you know in Taiwan I say well you know you got to watch out you never know what might happen with the, the US tries to uphold these principles and look what happened to the Russians in the case of, uh, of Crimea, a bunch of sanctions and, 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 and problems there. And, and their response which is interesting is oh we would never uh, invade Taiwan or do something like that because we wouldn't just be punished once, we would be punished over and over for the same thing. Mm -hmm. and, and essentially that's a recognition that, yeah, that's true, you would be punished endlessly. And, um, <laughs> and, and they have things to do, they have economic development to move forward on. So I, I don't think they're really interested in, in, in some big security disaster uh, that then blows back on the economy. And, and of course the Communist Party depends in part for its legitimacy you know, on its economic success, and it wants to have economic performance really almost at, uh, at, you know, as the highest priority. Yeah, from the... Um, I think this is... Sorry, could you tell us... No, sorry. Me? Yeah. No. I think this is a big... No, could you tell us who you are? Oh, Jonathan katz and I'm the correspondent of defense rep from South Africa in London, uh, and I'm a member of the Institute. Um, I think this is definitely a very interesting agreement, um, the first of its kind, really, and will pave the way potentially for other such agreements. 
but hanging over the sea are the emerging rules of the game. They, the Chinese, I suspect, got fairly scared of the U.S. reaction, denial of service attack on North Korea um, after the Sony, Sony attacks, indicating that they could paralyze the, the country. And that, I think, sent a very strong message. So you, I think, do you not have the slowly emerging rules of the game as you had in the nuclear age? You, had, you have uh, clear deterrence, which, said, which means um, a whole lot of things. And people know that, that they've got to pay, pay but Similarly, they know they've got to pay by certain um, rules of the game. Well, I mean, th th there's two kinds of rules of the game. There's aspirational norms of the way you, you think a state should behave, and there's practice, what they actually do. And, um, and in fact, there's a lot of um, you know, bad actions that are, that are taking place. I'm not going to speculate on, on what the United States might have done you know, under the table or or you know, how the sanctions affected the Chinese, I would just offer the following, that whenever you get an agreement between two states, it's because they both see it as in their interest. And um, so I would say that the Chinese see this as in their interest. They see it as stabilizing the U.S. relationship, and that's important for them in order for economic uh, development. Um, I don't know that you know there was coercion involved in this or not. I have no information about that. We did have the notion the sanctions threat was there. Uh, previously, you know, the Chinese have said we don't think the United States is serious about the intellectual uh, property issue. So I had verbatim quote and discussion of various officials and how they had handled uh, the discussion. Um, so I would say that um, this agreement means that the Chinese think the U.S. is serious now about intellectual property protection. Yes. Uh, Andrew Brook from the Australian High Commission. What does the uh, what's the UK's role in this? We're in the UK here today, so what's the UK's role in this? The US uh, has a level of clout uh, and power that China clearly respects. Um, can the UK achieve something as well, or is it uh, up to the US to do the hard work? Well, so this is an interesting question. Um, sort of, uh, I was going to go talk to some people about trade the other day. And the morning before I, I talked to them about the sort of the trade issue, which is the trade dimension here, and this is a preface. Um, previously, the United States was whining about uh, intellectual property protection as a cyber issue. So the State Department guys on cyber would say, you know, oh, wow, this is bad, we don't want to do it. Um, the sea change is when uh, the United States started understanding it as a trade issue and got organized for that. And uh, this is a challenge also for Europe which has tremendous clout with the European Union. And uh, when they understand it as a trade issue and they're prepared to um, treat it at that level, both in terms of, let's say, uh, any WTO cases to, uh, to get uh, cease and desist judgments and possibly penalties, and, and then revision of national law so that you are able to punish infringers um, under either you know, trade-related parts of law or under civil actions. So in the case of the United States, uh, we have um, domestic law which would allow the government to actually go after infringers mm -hmm. and private opportunities where uh, you, you, the court systems have awarded uh, you know, very interesting judgments um, to victims of IP infringement, and, uh, which include the um, uh, damages, lost license fees, and a compounding component. And if uh, RICO laws, which is the organized crime laws, are brought to bear, then uh, you can follow the conspiracy uh, to do all the collection, so forth, and pursue those people. And you can then pursue uh, the assets um, that they may have built up, having, having derived poisoned funds, which they then invested in legal activities. So you have a lot of asset seizure. So, so Europe, you know, is in a position to uh, to play this game, and uh, from the Chinese point of view, when I was uh, we're talking with them, you know, I had the uh, the IP protection issue in my high impact uh, norms, and, and they're like, oh, we don't need that, you know. And then I put in a long footnote explaining what I just told you, and um, I think it became apparent that 
um, under the legal system, which a president can cannot wave his hand and uh, and absolve you from any uh, li liability you might have there, um, you have high uh, credibility for the deterrent. The, the victims can get organized, they can they can get attribution, the evidence mobilized, they can come out and seize your assets. So if you're China and your idea is I've got a five-year plan, I've targeted IP to collect, and this is what I've been doing for 30 years, this is my approach, and then you realize that you're actually accruing large potential legal liabilities um, in your core sectors that you're trying to promote. So somebody could come, and then you're telling them to, oh, invest abroad. Um, so now you put the assets out in reach. Um, so that's a question you might want to think about fairly carefully if you were China. So these kinds of, the, the legal side of this is certainly something um, that uh, Europe and the UK would be able to pursue and, and other countries, and I would say the OECD more, more broadly. And that basically gets to the question of how are you organized for the protection of, of intellectual property and, and business secrets in your legal system. So France, for example, you know, as of, um, as of last year, didn't have a business secrets law, and they endeavored to, uh, to pass you know, a business secrets law with some fairly serious penalties for whistleblowers, which ended up scuttling it because uh, uh, they, were, they were too severe, and the press picked it up, so I think they're, they're uh, or revising it. I don't know where its current status is, but previously they had no law. So, so if you get that, that right, then you have the other guy's assets at risk, and then he's going to think a little harder about exactly what he's going to do. So, I mean, in some sense, if we back up again, um, you know, in the previous model where we whine about, the, you know, oh, he stole my IP, I'm going to whack some, uh, some hackers, you know, and you have an infinite supply of hackers, mm -hmm. so what, right? Once you change it to, I'm going to whack you in the pocketbook, mm -hmm. now it's an important issue, right? It's, it's, it's up at the, at the economic level. So that's probably a, a way to think about it. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. My name is Koichan Odera, uh, visiting fellow for Bruce. Um I'm very interested in the, uh, uh, what, you, what you mentioned about the uh, security dilemma over the cyber uh, offense capabilities. And <coughs> also, as you mentioned, it's hard to identify what cyber weapons are. So give, uh, having said that, how, how do you see the relationship between uh, security dilemma over cyber? Offense capabilities and the security dilemmas over conventional uh, arms or conventional arms race, and the, uh, you suggested the dialogue on military cyber capabilities would help mitigate the security dilemma over or the military tensions over uh, conventional arms race. So it's a complicated question. It's probably another talk, but let's see if I can answer it quickly. Um, so the problem is if you have no defense, then you have to rely on offense. And th those are notoriously uh, unstable systems. So you like to get more defense. Now one of the problems is that you think you have a deterrent capability because you have the offense to whack the other guy. Um, and as you phase in uh, higher security, it's going to reduce the, eff the effectiveness of that offense. You're probably going to have less offense. And so the judgment that you end up making is um, what's my net deterrence as I raise defense against offense? And there's a transition. So that's kind of the key question that one needs to think about in that. Um, the, uh, the structural security dilemma is basically that one unit of offense costs me uh, less than, uh, you know, a number of units of defense. And that's really a technological problem of how do I, how do I make defense cost effective? And you're not going to do it in the current technology playing very well uh, for the high-end actors at the military level. I mean, it's expensive to do military-grade assurance. You'd like to be able to do that for, for less cost. But, um, but I think the, uh, the dialogues can basically um, <coughs> understand the concept of operations and classified doctrines that the uh, different countries have. And what you'd really like to know is you would like to know that that the interaction of those doctrines when some event takes place uh, does not produce a bad outcome. But you don't know because the other guy's got his plan is, is classified, and yours is too. And the hard way to find it out is to have the interaction and then find out it went the wrong way. So that's an interesting dance of, how, of working that. Um, I think that was done in the case of nuclear. Uh, I'm not sure it was entirely effective. 
uh, with with Russia. Apparently, you know, the U.S. thought that they understood the deterrence model for nuclear, and then when the archives were examined, uh, they found they were thinking something else. <laughs> but they had behaved at least uh, consistently <laughs> with with it. Um, so that's basically, you know, do an analysis for stability. Uh, try to do what you can. You could apply sort of norms and restraints to know that if we engage in certain activities, it's destabilizing, back off from that. Uh, and then try to improve the technological way uh, to enhance stability. And take out the random actors that could uh, destabilize major power relationships. The major powers mostly don't want to uh, have a big war. It's bad for business. Um, whereas the random actors are much more likely to try to do something. Okay, I think we're, I'm afraid we're out of time, so I'm going to have, with apologies, uh, um, to, to draw things to a close. But, John, thank you. That was uh, a fascinating presentation. We always say at IISS that uh, our aim is not to uh, tell uh, policymakers or indeed anyone else what to think, but uh, how to think. And uh, what you've just done is uh, given us, um, I think, a master class in how to think about some of these issues. So thank you very much indeed. Can you please join me in thanking our speaker?